lot of what I talked about last year, what I alluded to last year, is going to take place this year with many of the aspects that we're going to be seeing. Actually, we're just going to focus on three major aspects. So the other thing I wanted to mention before we get started is it's not about making predictions in astrology. It's not about making predictions of outcomes. That's an area that is very precarious, very dangerous, and not really, it's something that the astrologer should stay away from. Unless, of course, the astrologer is known to be a very lucid psychic and is very accurate. But what the astrologer should be talking about mainly is possibilities for the year. Because there can be many possibilities at various levels. I'm going to talk about some of the possibilities. Nothing is written in stone. There's no nothing here that I'm talking about that may come true. Some of it may happen, much of it may not. It's just possibilities. So I want to stay with that tonight. Okay. So the first thing I wanted to talk about before we even get into the talking about the different possibilities is the chart that we're going to be using tonight. And let me just talk a little bit about this gentleman right here, Ebenezer Sibley. Ebenezer Sibley's chart is the one chart that is probably used more often than any other chart in astrology. There's several charts. Getting the right time for the chart in the United States has been absolutely horrifying because we just don't know. We just don't know the exact time for the, like the uh, time of the birth of the nation. But the one chart that's most commonly used is the one by Ebenezer Sibley. It's probably the most popular one that's used, probably the most comprehensive as well. But there's other charts, so we'll look at the Gemini rising chart a little bit too tonight, show you the differences. But Ebenezer Sibley was an English physician, astrologer, writer on the occult. It's all up there on the board. Son of a mechanic born in Bristol, 1751. He devoted himself to medicine, astrology, and he studied surgery in London. In 1785, he was working as an astrologer in Bristol. And by about 1788, he moved to London. On April 20th, 1792, he graduated from King's College in Aberdeen. In 1794, he was living in Portsmouth and became a Freemason there. As a student of medicine, he was interested in the theories on animal magnetism by Anton Mesmer, which, by the way, Anton Mesmer was the forerunner of hypnotism. So they, there's a strong connection between hypnosis and mesmerism. He joined Mesmer's harmonic philosophical school around that time. He later became interested in theosophy. For those of you who are theosophists, I think you might find it interesting that this gentleman was in later years a theosophist himself, became a theosophist, studied theosophy, and worked with it. The Sibley Natal Chart cast for the United States of America was published in 1787, which is interesting. That's the same year that the Constitution was written for the United States. But this is the most widely used chart today, and we'll get to it in a minute. But I wanted to talk a little bit about what mundane astrology is all about. Mundane astrology is basically looking at the chart of countries. Okay, It's really not about anything other than that, basically. Mundane astrology is the calculation and interpretation of a national birth chart based on the analysis of astrological effects when that nation comes into being. The effects that are delineated are most often political, economic, and cultural in nature, although tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about the geological as well. A national chart comes into being or is birth when a body of men and women write a constitution of laws which is agreed upon by all of its members. Generally speaking, when all or most of the representatives of that document writes his or her name to that manuscript, 
the government is officially ratified. But in some cases, like the United States, its horoscope was birthed when most of the delegates from the original 13 colonies signed the Declaration of Independence. Now, the, the birth of this nation is more about the Declaration, declaring ourselves independent from England, not so much about setting up the laws, which is the Constitution. In our case, it's more about the Declaration. This declara Declaration, though not an official Constitution of Laws, was signed on July 4th, 1776, announcing the colony's separation from English rule. There's been a lot of controversy over the years as to the actual birth chart of the USA. The Sibley chart horoscope cast for the United States of America was published in 1787 and is still used widely today. Though there has been some other charts that have been used for the USA with various birth times, the Sibley chart was birthed for 5.10 p.m. local time in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Most astrologers agree that the 5.10 p.m. on July 4, 1776 was the approximate moment when most, most of the delegates signed the document making it official. In spite of this, some of the other delegates scattered about the colonies signed the declara declaration days and even weeks after July 4th. You got to remember, they didn't have um, uh, cabs or they didn't have uh, Uber and they didn't have trains. They didn't have automobiles. They were coming in from their various different areas of the colonies. And so they were coming in by horse and buggy. And so they didn't all get there. They were supposed to all get there at on July 4th, 1776, but they couldn't. So many of them signed the Declaration days and even weeks after July 4th, which is very interesting. I always thought they were all there signing, but no, they weren't. Now, I'm going to go over this just a little bit. We're not going to go through all of these. It's not necessary. These are what the planets rule in terms of the individual birth chart, your individual charts on this page. Now, these key words are just a few out of many key words that I could have used. But, you know, I could, talk about, I could have talked about the sun and written a whole page on the sun, a whole page on the moon, Mercury, Venus, and Mars. But this just gives you a sense of what the uh, different planets rule. Like the sun rules vitality and character, willpower, leadership, Ambition, individuality, dignity, boldness, honor. Basically, the sun is what you're becoming over the years. And you become more of your sun sign as you get into later part of life. But the one planets, the planets I'm going to be focusing on tonight are Mercury, a little bit of Mars, a little bit of Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Pluto. These are the ones I'm going to be basically talking about. But not so much from an individual standpoint, but when I use the rulerships for the chart of nations. Now, this is when the planets take on a much broader scope of rulership. It's raised to a higher level. So, for instance, it's not just about leadership and boldness and individuality when you talk about the sun. When you're talking about uh, a country, such as the United States, you're talking about the president and his administration, the executive branch, state governors, mayors, or it could be kings of other countries. Any major ruler has to come under the sun. Uh, for instance, Mercury, the media, the internet, news agencies, primary and secondary education, even physicians. So you might want to refer back to this from time to time because it gives you an idea of what I'll be talking about when I talk about the chart. Because the chart of the United States is a much bigger, broader picture of the country as opposed to the individual chart. Okay. Now that's the Sibley chart. July 4th, 1776, 510 p.m., Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Uh, we use Placidus house cusps 
but I'm not going to get into all that. The house cusps are what really is the, the differentiation of all the different charts used. The rising sign here or the birth is based on Placidus house cusps and tropical zodiac is right here, Sagittarius rising. Okay. Which puts a lot of the plants that we're going to be talking about tonight over by down here when we talk about Pluto transiting. Pluto is also natally right there where Pluto transiting will be. We'll get to that in a minute. Here's Mercury. We're going to be talking about that tonight as well. Uh, we're going to talk about Neptune when it comes around and makes a hard aspect to Mars and, and Neptune itself, its natal place. So that's a, just a look. I know you may, probably are looking at it and saying, well, what does all that mean? Uh, you know, I'm not here to teach you astrology. I couldn't do it in one night. You know, I'd have to take you through a four-week course at least or longer. And that would even be pushing it. So just to give you an idea of what it looks like. So here's the two charts that really have been a controversy over the years. Here's the one we just looked at, with the Sagittarius rising. This is one that's very fascinating. But it was set for 2.13 a.m. Who comes in and signs in the United States Declaration of Independence at 2.13 a.m. in the morning? An astrologer? Maybe. Maybe some people would come in. Maybe would, some people would come in late at night. They'd come in just having a long trip, and they're, they just stopped off for a drink, and they stopped off for dinner, and they just couldn't go to sleep that night, so they stopped in and signed the Declaration of Independence at 2.13 a.m. I don't know about that. That sounds very, a little bit leery on my, my account. But anyways, this one is probably a little bit more realistic, 5.10 p.m. Uh, but this is interesting because it puts Uranus right at the ascendant, and Uranus has to do with astronomy and astrology and space travel and all things electronic, which the United States is big into. We, we're the forerunners in all those areas. So this, this kind of fits to some extent. The Uranus on the, um, on the rising sign, it's right there at eight degrees. See the rising's at seven, puts Uranus right there. I thought, wow, this really fits. But we don't really know. We don't really know the time. So we're going to go with this chart. But this chart is interesting too because it puts all these plants in the second house the second house has to do with money, income, has to do with the economy of the United States. And boy, we have a strong economy with Venus and Jupiter conjunct cancer and the sun there as well. So that kind of fits too. I mean, there were so many things in this chart that made it sound like it fit. But all the other people were pulling me saying, no, Dave, you're wrong. It's the Sibley chart. We're going to use this. So we'll use this tonight. I don't think it matters so much the houses. It matters about the planet and the planets transiting to the natal chart. That's what really counts. That's the most important thing. So this is the chart that we're going to be looking at tonight. Now, the middle chart here is the Sibley chart. That's the birth chart. And here's its house cusp, Sagittarius. Capricorn, Aquarius, so on, around the chart. These planets out here on this wheel is where the planets are for January 12th, 2020, which is just three days away. This is really in effect right now. This is powerful. And so I'm not going to show you different charts showing you down the road because that would just be very confusing. We're just going to stick with this one set of charts. So what we're going to look at tonight are basically three things. Saturn and Pluto conjunct at 22 degrees Capricorn and a bunch of other planets in Capricorn, Jupiter in Capricorn, Sun in Capricorn. There's Pluto and Saturn exact on that day. Mercury in Capricorn. Mars and Sagittarius is going to join them soon after. We have a lot of plants in Capricorn. We're going to talk about that and focus on the Saturn-Pluto tonight. We're also going to focus on, look, Pluto is right opposite the natal charts Mercury at 24 degrees. We're going to look at that tonight as well. 
We're also going to look at the third and most, well, I would say a little bit concerning to me is the Neptune, transiting Neptune, at 16 degrees Pisces. It's going to be opposing its natal self, its natal placement at birth, from birth, Neptune up here in the ninth house, and then also making a square to Mars at, right here, at, what degree is that? 21 degrees Gemini, forming what we call in astrology a T-square. That's difficult. So tonight I'm, I'm not going to be presenting a pretty picture of a nice box wrapped in a nice pretty bow, but a box tied in a very just difficult knot that we are going to go through this year. So it's going to be quite challenging for the country, for all of us, with this particular chart. Uh, people out there might be saying, well, Dave, don't you have anything good to say about what's coming up? Well, with every major aspect, even if it's a hard aspect, like the Saturn-Pluto, there's always a silver lining from that. And even with Neptune scoring Mars and Neptune opposing Neptune, there's a silver lining. Even the Pluto opposite Mercury, there's always some silver lining with hard aspects. So we'll talk about that. I'm not going to be standing up here being Davy Downer and being negative. I'm going to talk about this from both sides of the, well, looking at both from positive and somewhat difficult, challenging. Okay, so let's get started. First one, and these dates for this particular aspect that we're looking at, which is the Saturn-Pluto, my God, in three days. Now, every planet, or not every planet, but half the planets in astrology are in Capricorn. And soon Mars, as I said, is going to join them in Capricorn. That's a lot of Capricorn. How many Capricorns there? Okay. Are you feeling somewhat of a heaviness in your life right now? Because you could, it might not have your sun in Capricorn, but if you know your chart, how many know their chart? Okay, that's a good number. How many of you have a number of planets in Capricorn? Okay. Are you guys feeling that? Feeling that sense of sort of a heaviness and sort of a drain? Maybe tired a lot, more than usual, and it's heavy responsibilities. Okay? That's the feeling, and we all feel it to a certain extent. But I think Capricorns, and how many here are Cancers? Okay, are you feeling it as well? A sense of, or did you feel it, say a few months back, and now, and maybe into the future, next few months? Are you feeling a sort of, because these planets are opposing your planets in Cancer. So you might also feel a little bit under the, the weight of this. Anyways, we all have ca uh, Cancer somewhere in our chart. Cancer and Capricorns, and let me point that out. Right there is a sign of Capricorn, right there, second house in this chart. And all, look at all that's going on in Capricorn right now. And all up here is in Cancer. So you're over here, yes, seventh and eighth house, Cancer. So it's always the sign that the planet is in and the opposite sign of that planet. So it's Capricorn, Cancer. That duality is feeling this more than others. To some, to some extent, Aries, how many Aries here tonight? How many Librans? Okay. God, I've got a lot of fixed and mutable signs here. How many, uh, how many are in mutable signs? Pisces, Virgo, Gemini. God, look at them all. How many uh, fixed signs? Aquarius, Scorpio, Leo. Okay, so more, probably have more fixed and mutable than we do cardinal. Okay, that's all right. But you're going to feel it somewhere in your chart, if you know your chart. All right, so these are the dates when transiting Saturn and Pluto are making a conjunction. 
It's right there, August, January 12th, August 5th, November 20th, September 29th, October 4th. I'm not gonna go into all the direct retrograde of the planets. Just keep these dates in mind. These are dates when this particular aspect, Saturn and Pluto come back and forth and they conjunct one another. So you're gonna be feeling that energy around those dates. Now, again, let me talk about some of the possibilities that may appear this year with those planets in Capricorn and especially Saturn and Pluto. Violating the rule of, or the rule of law and abuse of power resulting in severe punitive consequences regardless of political party. The example would be the impeachment uh, we just had. That's a punitive indictment. Any violations of the law that are covered up can come to the surface. Pluto has this nature of being able to dig things up from underneath the surface. Bring it up to the surface and expose it. And then you have conjuncting Saturn, and so any type of executive position might be the thing that's in question here. Something of a, you know, like Saturn is rule, rules Congress, it rules the Republican Party, it rules uh, the legislative branch. So that whole thing with our country is sort of under the microscope. And so these various things I just mentioned are the things that are being undertaken right now. But right now, because we have all these planets in Capricorn, conservatism has its way right now. And even though they are under a lot of stress, they are still the one in power. They have the strength, in my opinion right now, because of all that energy in Capricorn. That's on a political note. So, uh, it can, obviously we talk about, we can talk about Brexit in the UK. It's not just, don't forget, it's not just these aspects are affecting the United States, they're affecting the whole world. But I'm just focusing on the US, it's hard enough just focusing on the US without having to focus on the whole world. So Brexit is a good example of conservatism. 170 appellate and lower court positions to this date have been filled with conservative judges. But that might has also have something to do with this aspect coming up, Jupiter in Capricorn coming up to Pluto, natal Pluto, and coming up to transiting Pluto. They're coming conjunct. What's the date that I have here? Peaking on April 5th, June 30th, and November 12th. So you could see more appointments of a conservative nature coming into being around these dates, April, June, and November. And that's just political. Let's move away from that for a moment and talk about the economic. Okay, now, I think one of the good things that have come out of all of this recently, maybe you will disagree, is the US and China reached a balanced and enforceable trade agreement which is really good for the working class and for companies. That was reached just a few days ago. That was signed into law, wasn't it, just a few days ago? And I'm not sure of the exact date, but it's very close to this Saturn-Pluto conjunction. What about the trend of the economy this year? Well, with all these planets in Capricorn, it tends to slow things down in terms of the economy. It doesn't mean that it, it tanks into a recession. I don't believe that that's really gonna happen. If it does happen, it might be toward the very end of this year and into 2021, but that's probably not the case. It's probably just gonna slow down and there'll be less spending. The manufacturing will slow down, probably. And the, the gross domestic product will go from uh, just around 2.2% right now, it might go down to around 2.0 uh, later in the year. So that's just a small decline, not big. 
So I don't think there is a real problem with the economy looking forward. I haven't looked into 2021. I'm just looking at 2020. But the economy looks like it's going to be okay. It's strong right now, as we know. There's an unemployment rate of 3.5%, which is very good. And like I said, the GDP is expected to go maybe down just slightly, but not much to really cause any real serious problems. Not enough really to... The, the unemployment rate may go up just a little bit over the next year or two, but not very much, okay? But the thing about Capricorn is you have to understand is that with all these planets in Capricorn, it just tends to make things go more slower, at a, but a steady pace. Now, they can go slowly up or slowly down, maybe back and forth a bit, but not really just like boom, suddenly sink and dive or suddenly go up. So it's a slow kind of going up and down. Let's talk about the Saturn-Pluto in relationship to the geographical. Okay, there it is. There are some of the things. Possibly even a recession, as I mentioned, but I, I'm doubting that now. Uh, higher interest rates, maybe. Manufacturing slowing down, maybe. Causing unemployment to go up. If it does, just a little bit. Again, these are all just possibilities. I'm not making any predictions. Geological. The possibility of more earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, especially around the Ring of Fire. But we just had one, didn't we, in Costa Rica? Not that long, a few days ago? Okay. And we saw, for the first time in a long time, a major earthquake with um, aftershocks in L.A. last summer, didn't we? So anything, does anybody, is anybody familiar with the Ring of Fire, where that goes? Okay, it goes around the... Um, the all through the western coast of America, up into Alaska, down into South America, then up around and up around into uh, Europe and India and uh, southern Africa, Southeast Asia. The Ring of Fire is the most um, susceptible area. But I thought something very interesting I saw is that on March 23rd, Transiting Mars is conjunct transiting Pluto. So this planet right here is in Sag right now, but it's going to go. Maybe I could just use the point. I don't want to be in the way here. Transiting Mars is in Sag right now, but it's going to go down, and it's going to conjunct Pluto, transiting Pluto, on March 23rd. At the same time, on that same day, which is very interesting, is Saturn will go out of Capricorn. Saturn right there is going to go into the sign of Aquarius at zero degrees. And it just popped in my head. Volcanic eruption? Maybe. Don't know. Possibly. Don't forget, Aquarius is just... Saturn and Pluto in Capricorn has to do with the underworld. Okay. Capricorn rules mountain ranges, tectonic plates, and Pluto is everything underneath the surface, right? They're conjunct, Saturn and Pluto. But then Saturn slips out into Aquarius, and Aquarius is sort of like everything happens in a very sudden sort of way. All of a sudden, an impact, possibly an earthquake, possibly a volcanic eruption. Will it happen? Probably not. But I'm just looking at it and saying that that's another possibility. As long as we have Saturn and Pluto conjunct, for as long as it's going to be through the year, these dates, uh, there's always going to be the possibility of that happening because of the Saturn, Pluto ruling the underworld. Saturn has to do with stress. Uh, an earthquake is stress when tectonic plates rub up against one another and create stress underneath the surface of the Earth and causes earthquakes and, some, in some cases, volcanic eruption. So there could be more volcanic eruptions and earthquakes coming up this year, just based on Saturn, Pluto, and even Saturn going into Aquarius the same day that Mars conjuncts Pluto. Does that make sense? Is everybody following that? Okay. Just keep the dates in mind if you don't. 
that's the, the main thing here. Let's talk a little bit about the fact that there are, and this, one, this is what really I find really interesting. There are 275 bipartisan bills signed in the House of Representatives. Bipartisan. Both parties. And they are sitting in the Senate waiting to be signed. Okay? They're sitting there. Nothing's happening. Saturn, Pluto, here's the double-edged sword. Saturn and Pluto together in Capricorn can create, it forges structures. It brings about things over a long period of time because Saturn has to do with longevity and chronic and things that happen over a long extended period of time that's lasting. And uh, Pluto has to do with intense getting to the bottom of things and reaching into the surface of our being and into the, the core of the, the government and creating these bills which are waiting to be signed. Infrastructure, lowering prescription drug prices, clean energy, improved health care, gun laws, improved background checks, raising the minimum wage. Protection for women's sexual rights, limiting the usage of op opioid drugs, and those are just a few. These are bills that are already signed in the House and are waiting to be signed and tweaked in the Senate and signed into law. That can happen under Saturn Pluto. But the other side of the story is they can also be blocked. Saturn has to do with blockage. Saturn, Pluto, one good example of Saturn, Pluto conjunct in Capricorn is the wall at the southern border between Mexico and the United States. That's a perfect example of Saturn, Pluto. And you can see the controversy over that right now. So, because Saturn has to do with barriers between nations or between, between countries, walls being built. Okay, and it's in the sign of Capricorn. Saturn is in its own sign. Saturn is in its most, its most comfortable being in the sign that it rules, Capricorn. So this is, a, you know, all these bills and the wall, however you look at them, negative or positive, has nothing to do with that. It has to do with what the astrology tends to point to. So... You could see all these things coming into uh, being. But if these bills were signed, it would really help the nation, don't you think? So anyways, that's a possibility, but we don't know. Now, I should just go back to 1914, just for a moment, because that was the last time that Saturn and Pluto came together but they came together in the sign of Cancer, over here, this sign, right? It was over here. Now, that was the, one of the last times, not the only time, it was one of the times previous to when we had those two planets conjunct. Saturn and Pluto also has to do with struggles. And we were in a major struggle right then, in World War I. What did it produce? Because there's always something as an aftermath that Saturn and Pluto produces. It forged the League of Nations, which eventually became the United Nations, which is still lasting today. That's what I mean. Things like this can last. Things that are created under Saturn Pluto will last a long time. So watch for what is being created, what comes into creation, these are the things that will be taking place this year. And so I talked about some of the possibilities. There may be a lot more. Maybe you know of some things, and that's fine. All right, let's, let's turn away from Saturn, Pluto, and the planets in Capricorn. Let's talk a little bit about this guy right here, Pluto, uh, in Capricorn. But he is going to be opposing the United States charts Mercury. Why is that significant? Because we have a lot of planets making aspects to the chart of the United States. If you look at the chart of the United States, Mercury 
at, sorry, I have to move in closer here, 24 degrees Cancer, is squaring Pluto. I'm sorry, it's opposing Pluto. Mercury and Pluto are opposed. 24 degrees Cancer and 27 degrees Capricorn. So now Saturn comes on down here and it's, and it's coming up. It's going to oppose Mercury and eventually conjunct its natal place, Pluto. Last time Pluto was in Capricorn was during the Revolutionary War. So now it's opposing Mercury. Pluto opposing Mercury. Dates to watch. Let's turn to the next one. All right, here we go. Capricorn, Pluto and Capricorn opposing Mercury and Cancer. These are the dates. Because this is when the actual energies of these two planets come together into an opposition. Exactly. And they come station direct, station retrograde, station direct again, going direct. So I'm not going to get into all that. But these are the dates throughout the year, pretty much throughout the entire year, that we have Pluto making this aspect opposition to Mercury. Now, what's interesting is transiting Mars conjuncts Pluto on June 18th, 2020. Ooh, that's going to be interesting because look at this. One of the um, dates here is June 26th. But if June 18th, Mars conjuncts transiting Pluto, acting as a possible trigger for some of the things that I've talked, I'm going to be talking about here. The nature of Pluto opposite Mercury is obsessive thinking, coercive behavior that has no real connection to the truth. All right? If left unchecked, it can lead to being, to being alienated from others who stand up for the truth. Think about that for a moment. Pluto opposite Mercury, not telling the truth. Obsessive thinking, coercive thinking. All right, that's coming into being as we get to these dates. February 27th is the first. So what are some of the possibilities? Well, this aspect, April of 2018, it's been in effect, Pluto opposite Mercury. And it will be around until January of 2021. The trade wars that we've had have slowed down the uh, domestic product, domestic production, gross domestic production. But Pluto opposite Mercury has a lot to do with uncovering scandals, too. Okay? So scandals, like, for instance, uh, a scandal uncovering large sums of money because this has to do with the second house, which is money and income. Eighth house has to do with money as well. Okay, investments, eighth house, taxes, uh, Wall Street, all that. Here we have this, which is the second house, which is income. So we could see an uncovering of a scandal involving large sums of money or tax returns that have previously been covered up. No need to go into that. A uh, sex scandal involving a political figure or some other rich and famous person. Pluto has a lot to do with sexuality. And the eighth house has to do with sexuality, too. So there could be a sexual scandal that's being revealed during this time. Don't know, but possible. Um, this aspect might reveal or uncover a scandal involving the Internet and Facebook. Don't forget, or verbal attacks on the media. Here's the thing. Mercury... This planet here rules the sign of Gemini. Here it is over here, Gemini, rules that sign. <clears throat> the se seventh house where Gemini is placed, this house, rules, among other things, foreign enemies. So we could see um, Foreign enemies, not just foreign enemies, but foreign, uh, foreign foes or foreign friends, too. All right? We have a lot going on in this house, natally, with Sun, Jupiter, Venus, and Mars. But Mercury is the ruler. So we have Pluto attacking or opposing Mercury. Mercury rules 
news agencies, the media. The second eighth, eighth house represent the economy, Wall Street, and taxes. So this makes sense that we could see a tax on the media, uh, the internet, news agencies, because it rules the seventh house. And these could be a foreign attacks, all right? Cyber attacks, for instance. Very much fits that scenario. <clears throat> All right. All right, now the one that I wanted to focus on more than any other tonight was this upcoming transit. Transiting Neptune in Pisces. Right there. In Pisces. Transiting through the third house. And forming, starting to form a, a T-square, opposing Neptune. It's not going to be forming a T-square this year, but in 2021. Okay? That's when this T-square comes into being. Neptune opposing Neptune, Neptune squaring Mars. But we still have on this, this year, June 22nd, transiting Neptune stationing retrograde at 20 degrees Pisces, that's pretty close to a square to the, uh, the Mars and the Neptune. 20 degrees, 22, 21. It's close. And it, whenever you have a station point, it's like a planet tends to slow down. It looks like it's slowing down as it's approaching another planet. It's sort of an optical illusion, but we call it station retrograde or station direct. And it looks like it's the other planets that it's, it's uh, approaching are moving backwards. Okay? Or that Neptune looks like it's going backwards as other planets pass it. So it's, it's, I'm not going to explain all that right now. But the station point, SR, station retrograde, is at 20 degrees Pisces. Very, very strong aspect. So that's coming into being this year. Now, why again do we talk about that one? Because we have in the chart of the United States Mars squaring Neptune. Again, you don't really want to focus on aspects like Jupiter conjunct Pluto, for instance, which is coming up this year, too. Let's talk about this for a moment. Jupiter is going to come up, and it's conjunct Pluto. But we don't have Jupiter-Pluto aspects natally, so that's not going to be as strong. It'll be felt. Something may happen when Jupiter conjuncts Pluto, but it's not in the natal chart. We have Pluto at 22 Capricorn. We have Jupiter over here at... What is that, eight, five degrees, Cancer? They're not really in any aspect here. But as we looked at the Pluto-Mercury, that was that's in the natal chart, and Pluto's conjuncting that, or opposing that right now, and it'll be conjuncting its natal place in a couple of years. And now we have Neptune and Mars square in the natal chart, and that's being focused by the fact that Neptune, which is one of the planets in this square, is now coming around, opposing its natal place, and squaring Mars. That's significant. That's significant. What does the Mars square Neptune mean in the natal chart? It could mean a number of things, but the thing that I looked at most of all and studied most of all, which really seems to make sense, is the Mars-Neptune square is a signature of wars that we have fought over the years that are either unwinnable Untenable, dubious wars. If you think about wars that either ended in sort of a stalemate or, uh, like for instance, I go through these Korean War. Never was really won one way or the other. Was both, it was settled at the, whatever, I can't remember the parallel, became North and South Korea. Not really, uh, nobody really won that war. It was never really, there was never really a decisive outcome. And then we have the war in Vietnam, which we lost, okay? The South Vietnamese uh, were t overtaken by the North Vietnamese, eventually the Iraq War. Well, they told us that we were fighting for, because there was weapons of mass destruction, which they never found. Again, these are all Neptune kind of things, things that are kind of shady, hidden, uh, hidden away, kind of cloudy, kind of dubious, kind of like... Eh, not very clear. Things are not clear when Neptune is in hard aspects. And so we had the war in Afghanistan, which has been going on for 18 years now, going on and on, seemingly unwinnable. 
So we have all these dubious wars that we've been fighting. Now, not the First World War and Second World War, because those involved other nations that sort of pulled us in to a war, involved other nations. We were attacked by Japan in Second World War, it brought us in, involved many other nations. We won that war, but because we were all allied together. World War I, the same thing. Pretty much the same scenario. We were pulled into that war with many other nations. So I'm talking about wars that America initiated. Those are the wars that seem to be sort of unwinnable and dubious at the very, at the very least. So that's what's going on. So could we have another protracted war, a cyber war, not just with Russia, but with other nations? Look what's going on between us and Iran right now, okay? Just a few days ago, okay? And I have it written down here. On Friday, January 3rd, 2020, U.S. drones assassinated Iranian General Soleimani. Many experts fear that this could spark a protracted war against Iran. Now, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But I thought it very interesting, though, that, that these missiles that they shot off didn't really do anything, okay? Thank God. But, you know, it was just sort of uh, shot. They shot them at our air bases, but no one was killed. I don't know how much damage was done. But, again, sort of kind of weird, strange. And then the killing of Soleimani, I, that could be considered a little bit dubious as well. Does that... You know, is that something that's going to, you know, cause a major war down the road? Maybe, maybe not. We don't know. So, some of the other possibilities. Terrorist attacks against mosques. Don't forget, Neptune is in the ninth house. Neptune in the, ni the ninth house represents mosques, temples, churches, and now, wasn't it the other day that somebody brought a gun into a church and started firing at people and killing people? And that was really just blew my mind. All of a sudden, all these other people in church get up and start shooting back and killing the guy. Yeah. I mean, we're having warfare in churches. You know, this is the kind of thing we have with Neptune, Mars. These strange, kind of weird, violent things happening just kind of blows me away in a way. Also, on December 9th, 2019, the Washington Post came out with the news that during the past three administrations, which is the last 18 years, our military commanders had no idea how to win the 18-year war in Afghanistan. And that's why it's continuing today. So again, this ongoing war, what's the end result? What's, why are we there? What are we fighting for? All that. Okay. One thing I should point out, and I'll kind of conclude with this, is that with Neptune opposing Neptune, and that's right here, right here, and it's not going to take, this isn't going to come into completion until March 31st and May 2nd of 2021 is when we're really going to see this come into a T-square. Pay special attention to that. And anytime Neptune stations around that time, because those are when these aspects that I'm talking about now are going to come into completion of the T-square. Uh, this could symbolize the ability for the U.S. and other foreign governments to realize the inherent unity of all nations. That's what Neptune opposite Neptune can do. Help us to realize that there's a unified unity between all nations. Okay? But only if, they, if we are willing to let go of old worn out ideas. Otherwise... During this transit, the U.S. will feel confused, defeated, and tend to withdraw into isolation. Okay. Now, you guys want to look at Donald Trump's chart? Yeah. Yes. God. How many, how, many, how many do? Oh, that's everybody. All right. Here we go. 
That's his charge in the center. He's got, on February 7th, transiting Saturn and Pluto opposing his Venus Saturn. What's really more, the more difficult is Saturn, because Saturn is included in the Saturn Venus, and it's opposing exactly his Venus and Saturn. Actually, it exactly opposes his Venus on that day, February 7th, and the moon acts as a trigger because it's right on the Venus. Right, and we also have Saturn is going to be opposing, it's already opposed Saturn before that. I don't remember the exact date. Pluto opposing uh, Saturn is right there. And in 2021, it's going to be opposed, Pluto is going to be opposing Venus, right? I found it very difficult for him to get through this. I thought to myself. But we have a Congress now, uh, a, a um, Senate, that's obviously um, going to probably acquit him during the trial. So I think he's going to get past this. But usually with oppositions, and that's what this is, Pluto, Saturn opposing, they're opposite, usually that indicates a sort of separation. So it's kind of a separation from the person from their office in this case, okay? But again, I'm just looking at the, the astrology, the possibilities here. I don't know. You know, when he had Saturn opposing his son, he got through that, right? But he doesn't have Saturn's son natally. This one, he has natally, Venus and Saturn. Now, there is the possibility, this is not out of the question, I'm not saying this is going to happen, but there is the possibility that he could have some health problems or health issues during this time. Uh, the Venus rules the renal system, which is the blood system. Uh, the possibilities here, and I'm not saying this is going to happen, I don't wish this on the president or anybody else for that matter, but there's that we can't rule it out as a possibility. You know, he really has a very strong constitution, I will say that. Uh, will he be impeached? I don't think so. Uh, he's, I mean, he's been impeached, I'm sorry. But I don't think he'll be, he'll, be, um, uh, he'll be acquitted. He won't be removed from office through the impeachment process, I don't think. But I do find it very interesting that these two planets opposing the Venus-Saturn are very, very difficult for anybody. For anybody, and, and oppositions usually indicate separation. Dave, you were talking about the 275 bills. Yeah. So my question is, uh, how does Mitch McConnell's chart come into play? That's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I didn't. I really didn't. That's a good question. I really don't know. I really don't know how what his chart, how that plays into the whole thing. I was just looking at what's going on with the country. Yeah, it doesn't hurt to look at that chart. Possibly some of the other members of Congress, too. Nancy Pelosi or uh, uh, Chuck Schumer. You know, other charts would be good to look into that, those charts as well. Any other questions? This is just a comment. Um, in the, I believe, January, February Mountain Astrology, there is a discussion of Mitch McConnell's chart. Yeah. So you may want to look at that. As you were talking, I, you know, you were talking about the uh, wars, the unwinnable wars, yeah. and all of a sudden it kind of popped into my head. Would that also kind of correlate in with the homeless and the mental illness piece that goes along with homelessness yeah. and unwinnable wars in a mental illness fashion? Yeah, that, that, yeah, you could look, that could be a possibility too. Although I would probably want to include Mercury in there. Yeah. And that's probably has a lot to do with the Pluto Mercury as well which we looked at second. So Pluto, Mercury, uh, but mental illness has a lot to do with Neptune and Pluto, no question, with Mercury, basically. So this is more with Mars, which has to do with wars and things, okay? Other things as well, but mainly uh, I, I see it as battles and wars. Yes, sir? Does anything in this chart indicate uh, Trump's life purpose? You know, his chart isn't any more difficult than most people's charts, okay? It's how you use your aspects. 
I mean, he has some really fine aspects in some areas, but he's with this Pluto Saturn opposing his Venus Saturn. That's a challenge to him right now. He's going through a lot of challenges. So um, I don't think we can judge him. It's really up to a higher power to judge his actions. But uh, what is his life lesson? Probably to uh, one of the things I would concerns me a little bit more than anything else is, and I'm not being negative here, but Neptune squaring his Mercury, which has a lot to do with the fact that he does tend to stretch the truth. Okay? I'm not going to go any further than that, but that's indicated very strongly. The Neptune, there it is again, Mercury is the mind and the things we say and speak and the way we think and the things we um, elaborate on and talk about and it's squaring Neptune and that means, that can mean somebody who's not being very honest, okay? So in regards to like Trump being our president yeah. and with the Saturn, Pluto, whatever you were mentioning, yes. is there possibly a silver lining to his presidency to create a long lasting impact for something like this not to continue or happen again within our leadership roles? Have you? He has dismantled a lot of things that Obama has established. And I would think after he uh, leaves office, whether it's in another year or another four years, five years altogether, uh, there may be, if it's a Democratic president, you may see that person trying to change a lot of the things that Trump did. So you always have that sort of back and forth going from one party to the next. And in a way, that's kind of good because it does create a balance. But, you know, in some cases, it's to the extreme. He's really wakened a lot of people you know, during these three years. And you're going to see a major turnout in the 2020 election, I believe. Both, both uh, Democrat and Republican. You see a lot more people vote one way or the other. Okay, so this, John, you may weigh in on this one too. As a, as a spiritual community, what advice can you give to us as far as how to navigate through this? whether like to hang on or what actions can we do to, to move through this period. Stay centered in yourself. Stay centered in yourself. That's really... And there are four things that I recommend people do during these crisis times. And this is because you wanted to... You asked a question about spirituality. Uh, meditate often. And pray for others, but pray that you overcome your own... Uh, shortcomings, challenges, which is shown in the chart, by the way, your own individual chart. Uh, try to work on improving yourself, reading and studying about spirituality. That's very important. Uh, books, whatever uh, Deepak Chopra or, you know, uh, the Theosophical Society or the Bible, whatever you follow, read a lot about that and get involved in study groups, okay, where you're all looking at maybe a certain religion or a point of spiritual point of view, and you come together and you uh, discuss it, all right? And doing some kind of spiritual service. For me, it's always been astrology because I feel that there's, you know, a person knowing about themselves through their chart is an enlightening kind of thing. Whether it, you know, there's other forms of uh, spiritual service. You know, whether you do yoga or meditation or teach those things. or Are you involved in any of those kind of things? What do you do? I do yoga. Well, then you're right on track with it. You're doing the right thing. And she comes here. Pardon me? And she comes here. And she comes here. <laughs> Absolutely. She's a member. Oh, there you go. Okay, so you're you're okay. You're Right on your track, right on your path, if you do those things. And I think everybody should do those things. Um, it's hard. It's hard. It, you get pulled away from those things. But the world will pull you away from your center. It's up to us to pull ourselves back 